Hey guys, Richard at Fish and Auto Channel and Reefs.com. Thanks for joining me today in pursuit of clean water. I am here in Orlando, Florida, in the headquarters of Aqua FX to find out how clean we could get our water to. Check it out. Well, first of all, we are in this salt water industry dealing with just water overall. And the most important thing that's often overlooked is a good, clean water. And I'm here with my good friend, Joseph, from Aqua FX, and he's gonna tell me a little bit about Aqua FX first. How are you doing, Joseph? Hey, Richard, I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Can good to see you about, again. Yeah, likewise, man. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about this company? Yeah, absolutely. The Aqua FX, we've been around forever. Marianne started the company 20 some odd years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a single mom with an engineering degree, and she knew how to make clean water. And it was with that knowledge, she was able to start a company, yes. start making water filtration units that's perfect for our industry as a good basis to build everything on for your fish and your corals. Yeah. You know, like I was mentioning earlier, this is such a basic foundation, but so important that, and it, that is often overlooked. I had several issues with my previous unit and I kind of wanted to go over it with these guys here at Aqua FX who are pro at what they do and then perhaps maybe you could learn something in the process and help me build my dream RODI unit. So the first problem that I was running through is that my city, as well as many of you guys are, that are watching, your city actually runs their water or clean their system using chloramine. Now, Joe, how does this chloramine differ from regular chlorine that used to clean our city pipes? Yeah, chlorine, it's very effective at sanitizing, but it, it's gas out of the water fairly quickly. So that's why a lot of cities are starting to use chloramines, which is chlorine combined with ammonia gas, mm -hmm. and it stays in solution much longer. So as a sanitizer, it's great in that it's disinfecting your water source, Sure. but for your tank, it stays in that water and it's difficult to get out. So bas basically what that does is regular carbon removes the, the chlorine out of the water, but leaves the ammonia behind. Yes. And then, which could go and get into our system, if not, gets picked up by a DI and then just kills a DI in the process, right? Correct, yeah. The, the carbon's good at removing the chlorine gas, mm -hmm. but the ammonia gas passes right through your RO membrane and then goes to your DI stage where it gets picked up, but that eats up your DI within 50 gallons or so. It gets used up very, very quickly. Oh, and that's expensive. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so what? how do you remove chloramine? Yeah, there, we use a catalytic carbon, which is designed specifically to remove chloramines, mm -hmm. and the surface area is treated so that it's able to absorb the, absorb the chloramines, and it takes that out of the water. But it does need a bit more time for that, chemo, for that reaction to happen. Sure. So that's why you need two stages of the, the catalytic carbon, or our chloramine blaster carbon, and that'll uh, address the chloramines for you. Gotcha. Now, I know that it, you know, like, it depends on how the usage of it or how much chloramine that's in the water. I know that usage will be, you know, varied. But let's say that, you know, like, let's say carbon will last about two, three weeks or so. Um, how, off, how long would, is there any difference? Like, in, like, how long it lasts? The chloramines, for most people, it, it's about six months. Six then, months? Yeah, that you swap it out. Uh, but as you said, it does vary depending on you know, your water quality and, and how much water you use. Right. Uh, but you know, compared to a standard carbon cartridge, you know, that'll last you know, a few hours. So it is dramatically you know, much, much more effective and lasts a lot longer. Gotcha. Yeah. And the second thing was that I don't think I have enough flow that's going in. Like, I, don't, I don't think I have enough pressure that's going through into my unit. And I know that you guys have some kind of a pump system for this type of unit, right? Yes, uh, the, the RO membrane requires water pressure for the clean water to pass through the various layers of the membrane. Mm -hmm. So when you don't have enough water pressure, it's not able to get that clean water through the membrane. Sure. Uh, so for this, these applications, we have our booster pump mm -hmm. that'll increase your water pressure and make the membrane work properly. So for those people that are watching and that are not too familiar with PSI and everything like that, what is the most optimal PSI for your membrane as well as what will happen if you have too much PSI and too low of PSI? Uh, the most optimal PSI will probably be about 80 PSI okay. is where you get the best waste to product water ratio. Sure. Uh, too high of a PSI, the water pressure, you might start running into water leaks through your little fit-ins or little o-rings and things like that, so you mm -hmm. don't want that too high. Sure. And then the membrane might balloon if the water pressure is too high. That is extremely rare case. Yeah. I mean, like, I think that will happen if you're in a high-rise or something like that where they have a booster pumps everywhere, right? Yeah, if you're well over 100, uh, 
uh, you might run into that problem, but it is pretty rare. Uh, more that we see are, is uh, low, low water, water pressure, mm -hmm. and then you know, when it's below about 45 or 40, there's just not enough water pressure to push w water through that membrane, and that's when you need a booster pump. Gotcha, and then what would happen if it's too low? Like, I mean, do you not just get water at all, or like it's like water, let's say if it's rated for 75 gallons per day, then you, not, you don't get 75, or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, below, let's say about 40, you know, mm -hmm. a 75 gallon membrane might give you like five or 10, so it's very, very dramatic of a difference. Gotcha. Yeah, and then also, uh, in addition to the water pressure, mm -hmm. uh, the TDS also affects you know how its ability to make water, and then also the water temperature. They both have effects on water production. So I think a lot of us at home, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but we suffer from these things called the lazy ass reefer syndrome, or LARS. <laughs> And you know, like a lot of times when maintenance is easy, we do it, but a lot of times we forget to, let's say, flush our membranes and such. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have anything that could, we don't have to, you know, like flush? Like, I mean, like it auto flushes? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, part of what makes a membrane last longer is keeping it clean, you know, right. just like anything else. And uh, some of our systems do feature an auto flush controller mm -hmm. that'll flush the membrane after every use. And what that does is that there are sediments and particulates that accumulate inside your RO membrane. Sure. And it, you know, it flushes a strong stream of water through that and get those sediments out and that extends the life of your RO membrane pretty dramatically. So let's say, for example, your RO membrane is supposed to last, last about a year or so. And if you don't flush every day, or if you make water, let's say, like a once a week or so, like mm -hmm. an average hobbyist, how long, like how much would it drastically kill your RO membrane? Um, that part could vary quite significantly depending on how bad your TDS is, but mm -hmm. I will probably say 30 to 50 percent longer would be the average. Wow. Yeah, so, and you know, by having a more efficient, uh, cleaner membrane, mm -hmm. every, the rest of the system also works better in that your membrane is cleaner and it's letting more water through. Gotcha. Now, a lot of people who doesn't know the art of this reverse osmosis process, how does oral membranes work? Our own membranes, um, it's simple yet complicated. <laughs> right. Before when I looked at it, it looked like just like a roll of papers. Yeah, just a like sleeve just of different papers. How it works is that it's a, it's a plastic membrane right. that has tons and tons of tiny little holes. Mm -hmm. And by having pushing water pressure through there, uh, it separates uh, the sediments and the particulates from the clean water. Right. So only your pure H2O is able to make it past the membrane and the, the dirty water it flushes through the wastewater line. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, and I saw that you guys offer two different types of membranes, right? Yes. Uh, the RO membrane, it can waste a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Typically, you get three to four parts of wastewater for every part of product water. Sure. Um, for, for, for Florida, it's not too big of a deal because water is everywhere. <laughs> right. We but have in, a water in abundance here, but, uh, but California or something like that. Yeah, in story. California, water is expensive, you know. Uh, so you might want to use as little wastewater as possible. Uh, so we do have a one-to-one -one ratio TFC membrane, wow, okay. and at 60 psi, that makes one part of product water for every part of uh, wastewater. So you're wasting sure. less water. Gotcha. Now, is there any like a difference in, in let's say productivity or like longevity of the life of those products? Difference between those, between those two? The membra membrane membrane-wise, the the life expectancy is about the same. They're just yeah. designed a little bit differently. Um, but you know, whenever you make more product water out of this with less wastewater mm -hmm. the TDS does creep up a little bit it's, it's not significant but there mm -hmm. is a slight difference gotcha. so it's kind of a trade-off between how much wastewater you want to produce and how much product water you want to produce mm -hmm. and you know how clean that water is right and how much TDS would you will you be willing to tolerate yes right? <laughs> fortunately it's not significant gotcha, yeah, gotcha. Yes. all right so now that we address some of the questions that I had and some of the issues that I had with my previous unit let's go through all the chambers of the unit and learn about what they do Yes, uh, a typical RODI system has four stages. Mm -hmm. And in more elaborate systems, you could have multiple cartridges of each stage. Sure. It starts with a sediment filter, and what that does is remove sediments, particulates, rust, and you know, just things that'll clog up your RO membrane. Right. Uh, so the sediment filter, it's called a poly blown sediment filter. Sure. It's kind of like cotton candy, just a lot of layers of it and very dense. Right. And that's, that works great for taking little particles out of the water. Sure. And it goes on to the next stage, which is your carbon stage. 
and that deals with things like you know chlorine is the main thing that it takes out sure it also takes out you know, um, volatile organic compounds and sure. a lot of other kind of chemicals right. that the membrane will not take out right so once water is processed by that uh, that your carbon stage it goes to your TFC membrane and that's kind of the heart of your RO system sure. and it, it separates the clean water from all the dirty contaminants that you don't want. Sure. Um, and then from there is your last stage is your deionization stage. Sure. And DI resin, uh, it's both po there's positively charged particles and then negative charged particles. Sure. And they're great for taking out um, like ions like sulfates, phosphates. Mm -hmm. Uh, basically all the remaining chemicals that the RO cartridge didn't catch. Gotcha. And that leaves you with a pure zero TDS water. Gotcha. Yeah. So the reason, main reason why I stopped by here in F Aqua FX, it's like actually about three and a half hours away from me, is because <laughs> I wanted to build the perfect RODI machine. I've been grilling <laughs> Joseph about, about a month, month and a half, <laughs> and we have put together something, something quite special. And actually we're gonna build it right now because one thing that's great about aqua effects is everything is sourced and made in usa and i really like that i really like that because you know if anything happened i know they'll be here for me and i, you know, I know they'll be here for you as well so we're gonna go ahead and then build a unit of my dreams and you guys go check it out going in here so in would be my first stage sediment second stage chloramine blaster catalytic carbon Third stage chloramine blaster, catalytic carbon. Boom, we've got those nice and done. So I'll go ahead and at this time attach my bracket. Here's a, so an important part about chloramine blaster carbon sure. is that it is, we hand pack it here at the shop. So it, it has the fines or the dust that a lot of carbon is associated with. So right. carbon blocks don't, which is, kind of good and bad, more so good that you don't have to rinse them, bad that the carbon is bound together with an adhesive. So there's no ad adhesive on this carbon, so we have to make sure to rinse it. So a part, an important part of this process will be just to make sure that we have a bleed valve right. um, that will open up at the beginning of the process. You know, a lot of people look right past valves. When you're perpendicular to the valve, you'll be closed, you right. know, so we'll send them open. So even if you miss it, it's going to immediately leak water out of the, you know, the rinsing valve. So we try to keep it simple. Yeah, you know, that's actually the first time I heard that. I didn't know those kind of like, you know, like we do usually get those, you know, carbon blocks on a, on a yes. like just regular canister. Yes. And then in the form of canister. So we thought that they, they were just held together by those, you know, like fabric material. Right, right. No, it's not always obvious. The adhesive is, we lose surface area. So as Joseph was mentioning, uh, surface area is very important with carbon. When we right. bind it together, we lose its ability to uh, absorb uh, what it needs to. We use a liquid filled pressure gauge with a booster pump being mechanically driven. If you don't have the, the glycerin liquid, it will jackhammer a lot. It's really hard to figure out what pressure you have. The, the right. liquid will dampen it so that you can kind of see where you're, you're operating at. Last finicky touch, we just make sure that it's, uh, you know, uh, oriented, yeah, oriented right. correctly so it's not, you know, upside down. So we're gonna go ahead and open up the 100 gallon per day sure. uh, TFC membrane. Uh, manu uh, membranes are manufactured wet, the, the element is moist, so right. this will be the only part that the end user will have to install themselves. And if you actually give it a little nudge, you'll kind of feel it, yeah. So in the end of the membrane housing, there's a little, uh, port and these two o-rings will seat into the port right so sometimes yeah you just kind of want to feel it push into that port and then you'll know you're good to put the cap on gotcha the port that is closest to the center of the end of the membrane housing will always be your your product port so a lot of times folks will they'll start twisting them one right. way or the other and you know they like to use the orientation top or bottom well if you twist it towards you top and bottom reverse so i try to get folks into the habit of looking at which port is almost in the center and that will always be your ro permeate you know your good water product water permeate water uh, kind of interchangeable. Uh, your wastewater sometimes is referred to as the concentrate because it's literally got TDS that's higher than your top water. If you're incoming at 100, you should be 10 or less leaving the membrane product. The wastewater could be 150, 170. It'll actually be concentrated TDS. 
so, okay, so we're on the yes. second stage. So we're on the so first stage, second stage, third stage. We're actually on our fourth and now fifth stage mm -hmm. uh, RO membrane. So yeah, another uh, 100 gallon per day um, Aqua FX dash heated TFC. Now, the, what's the benefit of having additional RO, RO membrane? You're going to have faster production. You know, the RO membrane is always the bottleneck of the equation. Sure. So if it's just a, a convenience, you know, 100 gallons per day is four gallons an hour. Mm -hmm. And when you do 200 gallons per day, you're going to double it. Really? Um, we found with the quarter inch tubing, we can accommodate up to three membranes. And then from there, that's kind of where you need to transition over to a, maybe a commercial system. Gotcha. So it looks like um, with this one, with the glycerin, the, the gauge, this one goes before it goes to the RI? That, uh, that's RO absolutely membrane. correct, yeah. So our uh, the only part that we're really concerned about having pressure is mm -hmm. our RO membranes. So this will be immediately before your RO membrane feed, which brings up another great point. If your filters do get clogged, you may notice that you have lower operational pressure. Right. So at that point, yeah, you may want to go ahead and change out your, your pre-filters just to get your uh, optimal RO membrane performance back right. totally. So this is the wastewater or concentrate. Gonna go ahead and just connect those together so that we can uh, then send it through our uh, microprocessor controller, which is gonna uh, ultimately give us our um, automatic flush function, controls the pump, uh, prevents itself from running dry. There's a low and a high pressure switch, so that's sure. kind of useful. And then we'll begin our second bracket. Our second bracket will be our ion exchange resins. So we're about to pack some DI, DI resin. Which color? There's, I see that there's multiple different colors. What, which one is this one? So the traditional, this one is the cation sure. uh, DI resin, color changing cation. Sure. Traditional DI bed will be a mixed bed of cation and anion. So cation being your positives, I remember that because there's a T in cation, mm -hmm. simple. Okay. And then anion is our negative, the only other option. So that's nice gotcha. and easy. Uh, what I aim for is you take out the sponge. Sure. You basically give it a solid fill, maybe even another fill. At this point, I will tap it once or twice and then go for our final kill there. And a little more tapping to allow for room for the sponge. Get rid of any excess DI resin. Go sure. ahead and screw it on there. Try to get it, uh, you know, to not cross thread with any extra DI media. Sure. And then we're good to go. We notice that uh, it is a cartridge that wants to be aimed up, so we want to, you know, put it into the canister the right way. Sure. But aside from that, there's really not much you could do wrong here. Gotcha. All right, so we just packed this one, so we're going to do the next one down here. Absolutely. Let's take a look. So I'll grab a fresh Bass empty right there. shell. Yep, we'll go ahead and open our anion DI resin. Sure. Now the anion, much like the mixed bed DI, will have a sort of fishy smell. Um, they refer to the smell as amines, and it is part of the manufacturing process behind the DI. So it's, it's very normal to smell fishy. Gotcha. We'll go ahead and get this guy, same process, mostly full. We'll give him a couple of taps. Sure. And then we'll finish that off, clean maybe some of the threads. Tap yeah. it in and then just get the sponge in. Again. Now, the mm -hmm. quick question is, when Please. you put this inside the unit, mm -hmm. is there? do they have to be in any order in particular? So the way that we like to run it, yeah. The most effective way when you're running a separated cation anion approach would be, we want to start off with the, the cation, so sure. the uh, purple color change resin, sure. uh, followed by the anion, which will be the, the bluer resin. Sure. Uh, we then follow that up with the mixed bed resin. So the ideology behind that is our mixed bed resin is going to make sure that uh, basically we have p neutral pH, uh, we've effectively removed everything from the water through the, the three stages at that point. And um, that's going to give you the most effective, longest lasting DI resin and the, you know, zero TDS water that we know we need uh, in order to achieve our hobby. Awesome. Yep. And then we'll go into our anion. Perfect. No, it won't fall on you. From the outside and will actually uh, enter through the bottom of the canister. So that's that. All right. Perfect. So 
So the TDS probe that the controller uses, we put after the RO membrane so that you can see what the water is going into the DI chambers. You know, that that old, that is a large factor on how long our DI resin is going to last. So that's one area that we really like to monitor is just after RO, but before DI. Gotcha. So getting into some of the mechanisms within, we've got a, a quarter inch solenoid that is in charge of kind of keeping it automated. So as I was mentioning, when your float valve kicks up, uh, system's going to shut down. This solenoid is actually the one that blocks the flow into the RO membranes. Um, the second quarter inch solenoid. Sure. Oops, sorry. Let's go like this. So this second quarter inch solenoid, that's going to be our flushing solenoid. That is what actually uh, opens up to flush the RO membranes, right. releasing some of that scale, helping them last as long as possible. Okay. Um, the RO membrane is not only the meat and potatoes of the system, but also uh, the most expensive filter of the system. Mm -hmm. So if we can help them last longer, you know, it's just uh, money yeah. saved for you know, coral. Right. Yeah, literally. And I think that's it, literally, with the controller, yeah. Okay, then let's hook this bad boy up and then get it going. Cool. And then I remember correctly, yes. um, I think you guys have some quality control right after this one. Like, I think like you guys do like a pressure testing. And absolutely, stuff, right? absolutely. So we pressure How's test. How's that done? So we literally have an air compressor that we hook up to one end of the system. We uh, cap off all the other ports and we bring it to a pressure higher than we ever expect you guys to run it. Sure. Um, we will, you know, if we hear uh, a leak, you know, sometimes we'll get uh, soap water and just kind of check for leaks, but um, our assembly team is very efficient. Usually, you know, they'll let it sit for five, 10 minutes under pressure. The pressure stays constant. We know that there is no leak, you know? So it's only if we're really chasing down a gremlin that we have to use the soap water approach, but sure. you know, it could happen. So I've been painting their butt for a few months now, month and a half or so. And I've been so anal about low TDS and all these problems that we could run into. And they said they want to make this as a special system where you guys could uh, purchase as official auto package here on Aqua FX. And you can find them at where? AquaFX.net or AquariumWaterFilters.com would be the two quickest ways. Uh, we do have a, a nation of wonderful vendors who help us to build our name and, and get to the you know grassroots of every local area. So uh, your local fish store really should have what you're looking for. And if not, they can call us and, and get it. Gotcha. So if you're looking for the ultimate, the ultimate RODI experience, do check out this unit at the web that he just uh, described below, aquafx.net. All right, guys, so today we just finished making my dream RODI unit. This is called the Fishonado unit from AquaFX. If you guys want to purchase it, you will go purchase it from their website, AquaFX, and visit all their vendors, and they, they should be able to order these for you guys. And these are all made in USA, so any parts, any resins or whatever, anything, they make everything in-house, so be sure to check them out whether it is just for RODI unit for the, your aquariums, as well as drinking waters, and pretty much anything that's water related for life. Yeah, right? absolutely. Our, our home use, our pets, uh, commercial systems, right. uh, residential, you know, we kind of just do it all. And uh, we look forward to challenging uh, water problems. You know, sometimes if it's not an off the shelf solution, it's, it's something our team can, uh, you know, create a solution for you and, and whatever the problem is, definitely. Right. Well, thank you so much for putting up with me. <laughs> not thank <laughs> you for coming. Me making this beautiful unit. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the shows in the yes, future. Yes, absolutely. And putting this beautiful unit in my house. Thank you. Thank you.